a warm welcome to all of the muscular dystrophy New South Wales community today to our Neuromuscular Information and Research Day. This it is the first time we are running it online. So um, thanks to COVID, we're now able to include more people from across New South Wales and also into other states and territories. So a very warm welcome to all of you here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues that have um, assisted in setting today up. Um, we have a background, a little group of people in the background there. Alicia is our, um, our person. Hello, Alicia. <laughs> She's our person who is our tech guru. And so if anyone has problems today, they can, um, they can ask for assistance and Alicia will be able to sort that out with the technology side of things. Um, yeah, and there's a whole range of, of our, of our um, people from our organization here today and we'll hear more from them later on. So congratulations and thank you to all of you for taking time out of your weekend to join us, to hear from a range of really valuable um, speakers, including people with lived experience, which is a very, very important part of, of this conference, and also from the medical professionals who, who have that topical and relevant and up-to-date information about things that are um, related to, to us and our care and our treatment. So we have a full program over the next three hours. So um, before we do that, I would like to introduce Olivia Eggleton. Olivia is a 15-year-old uh, Indigenous high school student from Pendle Hill High in Sydney here. Um, Olivia enjoys going to the theatre to see musicals. Um, I know that because we went along to see one last year together. So I'd like to welcome Olivia, who is going to do our official welcome to country. Thank you, Olivia. You should now be unmuted. Hi, um, I would like to acknowledge the Darug Nation, as well as the many other Aboriginal nations all throughout Australia. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay respects to elders past, present and to those in the future, for they hold the memories, traditions, custodians and hopes of Aboriginal Australia. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's great to have a member of our community be able to share that with us and to, you know, um, to have someone in our own community be able to do our Welcome to Country I really appreciate that and it's great that we're able to welcome people from all different lands across across our state. So thank you very much, Olivia. We really appreciate that. So our next part of the agenda, we're going to warmly welcome our first keynote. Oh no, I'm going to go back up to do some housekeeping. That's what I was going to do, wasn't it? Housekeeping is a very important part of, um, of this session, particularly being online. So um, I just wanted to let you guys all know about some of those technical housekeeping issues. Um, we will be recording today's sessions, including the breakout rooms. Um, so um, as I was mentioning, when people are coming in the room, if you did want to change your name that's on your screen, um, you can do that by pressing the three dots in the right corner of your, of your screen and change that to your first name only, if that's something you'd like to do. You also um, will be on mute for most of the session um, while the presenters are speaking, just so that we can make sure there's no distractions in the background. Um, but there will be time for questions throughout the day and, and I'll let people um, be unmuted when there are time for questions if, if you're selected to be speaking. Um, you also have the option of putting questions into the chat box. So um, Alicia will, will be monitoring that and we'll be looking at that through the day. So if people want to say, um, they agree with something or they, you know, they, they want to um, throw in a question at any time, feel free to use the chat box function in Zoom. Um, when you do speak, if you're asked to speak, um, it's really great if you could also say your name before you speak so that people know who's speaking. Um, and also try to speak clearly and, and fairly loudly so that we don't have problems with people hearing you. Um, if you need to leave, that's also fine if you just wanted to um, close your, you know, unshare your camera, um, or, but it would be nice for you to let us know if you were leaving for the day. The program today, we have two keynote speakers. That will be um, Dr. Farah and Samantha Bryan. And then after that, we will have a short break for 15 minutes. Um, but we do ask people to return promptly from the break so we can keep to time today. No one wants to be kept 
kept in late, do they? We all won an early mark in the end. Um, so when you go into your breakout session, you should be allocated into the correct session, but we've wanted to make sure that people are in that. If you um, end up into a breakout session that you're not wanting to be in and you'd like to choose another one, you can just go back to the main room and then um, Alicia will be able to allocate you to a different breakout room. Um, then we'll have a short break after the, the breakout sessions. We'll come back for our final uh, section, which is the lived experience panel. We've got a great panel of people today speaking about how they are independent in their lives. So we don't want to run out of time for that because that will be um, excellent, I'm sure. And we also want to leave time for questions because um, we want this session to become interactive. So um, yeah, we, we're going to plan to wrap up by 5 p.m. sharp. So let's try to keep to time as much as we can. And on that note, um, unless there's any particular other things I've forgotten, um, we would like to introduce our first keynote speaker. So I'd like to introduce uh, our friend, Professor Associate Professor Michelle Farrer, who is a paediatric neurologist at the Landwick. Michelle Farrer is a, um, a specialist child neurologist um, she leads the neuromuscular clinical and research programs there at the hospital. Um, she's focused on developing treatment and beyond to people with neuromuscular and neurodevelopmental and rare genetic um, disorders. So um, her research program focuses on um, genomics research um, and together she's got a very strong consumer consumer involvement and I've been involved in some of her, her work there with, um, with us people with SMA. So she's currently the lead um, of the Neuromuscular Diseases Clinical and Research Program and she also is um, leading the New South Wales ACT Newborn Screening Pilot for, that's a whole lot of mouthful of words, but she is basically our friend and um, a very clever professor. We'd like you to all, all warmly welcome Michelle Farrer to the to the um to the the zoom so michelle if you would like to if you would like to share your screen then potentially you will be able to share your you've already done it you must be an, an expert at zoom by now <laughs> can you michelle can you all hear me yes excellent um so first of all a huge thank you again for um, asking me to come. I, it's a highlight of the year. Um, I've been coming to the information days, I think. Well, this could be the 10th year um, and it's something I really look forward to and just deeply enriching for my clinical practice and research to um, spend some time with the community and really look at ways that we can really continue to move forward and um, improve treatments and care and support for everybody living with muscular dystrophy. So thank you again. Um, today, I've been asked to talk on gene therapy in neuromuscular diseases. Um, I don't think when I'm screen sharing, I can see questions as they come through. So Carolyn, if you can just interrupt me, I'd be happy to be stopped if um, that's what you think's appropriate. Um, so I guess the first thing to say is there are lots of different ge genetic therapies for neuromuscular diseases and the focus of what I am going to speak on today is gene replacement therapy um, and I think the example that some of you may know is the therapy that's been approved in the US for spinal muscular atrophy called Zolgensma. But I'm not going to talk specifically on that. I'm going to talk about it across a range of neuromuscular diseases. But I also think there are other therapies. Um, the ones ending in EN, so nucinesin, etelopasin, um, are also genetic therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. Um, they're actually acting on the genes that you have in your bodies to change the way they're working. Whereas um, what I'm going to talk on today is where we're looking at adding genes to the body. Um, and the goal is to introduce a working version of the gene so that it's in charge of creating key proteins for neuromuscular diseases. 
Um, so I think, first of all, it's important to think about what the goal of treatment with gene therapies are. And it's going to, I think, for me, um, it's individual. And so I think for every person, they need to think about what they would like and expect from a therapy. Um, it offers hope for slowing and managing symptoms. And I think that really, I'm um, avoiding the word cure because I think it really depends on where an individual is in terms of where they are with their neuromuscular disorders, what they could expect and hope for for an outcome. Um, the genetic instructions, I mean, to introduce a gene into the body, you need to give it inside something. You can't just, it's like sending a letter. You have to put the letter inside a post, inside an envelope and then post it in. And then the mail gets delivered. Um, you take the letter out of the envelope, so to speak, and the letter is in the cell and it introduces the gene. So the vectors like the envelope, it carries the information to where it needs to be. And it's doesn't the vector doesn't stay in the body. It's just the delivery vehicle. And I think my my daughter's actually preparing a baby shower at the moment. She's trying to show me all the decorations. <laughs> that was being a bit distracted. Sorry. Um, so the vectors um, that are commonly selected for gene therapy at the moment are viruses, and that's because they're able to enter the body circulate the body and um, deliver the genetic material. It's kind of a little bit poignant with coronavirus. Um, but the gene, um, the viruses that are selected for gene therapy are carefully selected so that they're not dangerous, that they're not going to cause big sickness. And the, um, a lot of them are um, viruses that aren't dividing by themselves. And so once they deliver the message with the envelope, they leave the body and they're gone. But I think like any letter, it's very important about what the size of the message is. So it's very important to think how big is the gene that I need to post into the body. So some genes, um, I guess what you can you put into a virus is restricted by the size. And so, for example, dystrophin is one of the biggest genes in the body. So the way that um, scientists are approaching gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy is they've actually invented a mini dystrophin gene. And the reason for that is so that the, um, it can be packaged and that the size is appropriate to put into the vector or the envelope to deliver into the body. And one thing that's really important um, is that for each different type of neuromuscular disease, a gene therapy would need to be designed specifically for that. Okay. So um, this um, picture really illustrate, oh, oh, it's gone too far. Okay. So here are some of the strategies that are relevant for different neuromuscular diseases. And the ones that I'm aware of that are currently in commercial clinical trials, so drug companies paying to develop drugs so they can sell them should they be shown to be safe and work, um, are being researched for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and a number of different types of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And I'm sure that you will be aware of others that are also in research and um, can mention those as well. Um, so I think, the, the approach really varies in terms of what is happening at the genetic level. So in um, disorders where there's a loss of function mutations, so that examples would be spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And what happens there is that the gene um, is the mutation that's causing the disease means that the gene is not working so no functional protein is actually produced. So the strategy for those disorders is to introduce a functional copy of the gene straight into the cell and therefore what will happen is that the new gene that is introduced will start producing the therapeutic protein. For other diseases, some of the um, limb girdle muscular dystrophies, particularly the dominant types, this approach wouldn't work because what happens is the basis of those diseases 
is that there is a gain of function mutation. And what that means is that in your own genes, what is happening is that the genes are producing protein that is not that is causing the disease. So actually introducing another gene to produce protein is not going to actually work. The approach is that you need to give a new gene that's actually going to block the gene that is bad. And that's going to block it from working. And because they're dominant diseases, it means everybody has two copies of genes. And so if you're blocking the gene that's not working properly, it means that that one's blocked, but the good gene that's sitting alongside it, which isn't shown in this picture, unfortunately, will be allowed to work by itself and produce the protein that you need. So that's how that approach would be working. So gene therapy um, needs to be custom designed to know which gene you want to introduce and what you want the result to be. Do you want to make more protein or do you want to block that other gene that's in the cell and make less protein? And um, I guess everyone will have heard of other strategies um, and I just wanted to mention these, but these to my knowledge are not yet in human clinical trials. So there's gene editing and that's called CRISPR. And what happens here is that it's actually using scissors to cut out the bit of the DNA that you don't want that is just causing the disease. And then the virus is introducing a healthy DNA sequence back in where the cut has been made. So in fact, the whole sequence has been corrected in the person and in the cell so that it can be working properly again. And the final approach is ex vivo gene therapy. This approach is being used for um, some cancers and you might've heard of a drug called CAR T cell or Chimera. Um, it's also being used in some of the leukodystrophies, um, particularly adrenal leukodystrophy. So what happens here is that stem cells are collected from the person living with the disease. And in, a, in the lab, those cells are modified, again, using viruses that carry the genes. But um, then once those cells are corrected in the lab, then they're given back into the person through an injection. And that's how um, ex vivo gene therapy works. And the reason for that, the difference is um, for some blood disorders um, that if um, you need it to be within the, um, your own DNA. And so the previous approaches that I talked about, um, I'll, I think the next slide actually shows it, so I'll let it go here. Um, yeah, so this, this actually shows how the gene gets into the cell. So you've got the vector, which is like the shell or the envelope that carry, and it's a virus in this case, and it carries the gene around the body and it binds to the cell and it is carried into the cell. And there's lots of complex steps of how the cell processes the virus in the cell. But ultimately, it gets into the nucleus and the virus uncoats and the genes released into the nucleus. Now, this is where your own DNA is sitting over here. And one of two things can happen. Um, and this depends on which virus you select. So if it's what's called a non-integrating virus, the gene sits in the cell nucleus but outside your own DNA and is in a place called the episome and it continues to work by itself. And um, the um, viruses that are being used to treat neuromuscular diseases are using this approach where they're non-integrating viruses, um, such as adeno-associated virus is the name of the one that I'm most familiar with. And so if a cell is going to divide, and make a new cell because it's not in your own DNA. It doesn't go to the next generation of cells, so it won't pass on. Now that's okay for nerve and muscle disorders because they're non-dividing cells. But for an approach where you're trying to treat blood disorders or um, cells that are dividing a lot, that won't be any good because it will work for a little while until the cells divide again. And um, a lot of the viruses that are able to introduce DNA into the cell and into your own DNA 
um, uh, things like herpes virus or lentivirus. And as soon as you hear the names of those viruses, you go, I've heard of those before. They actually make people sick. So that is why the blood's taken out of the person that's done in the lab in the test tube and then the cells are transduced. So the gene is introduced into the DNA. And then the virus is removed from those cells so that, that the person doesn't get that virus because you don't want to get herpes virus. And then it's reintroduced back. And then if those cells want to divide again, um, they will continue to carry that gene on into the next um, generation. So um, again, I think which virus you select really depends on what you want the gene to do. Do you want it to go into the DNA? Do you not? But also some viruses target specific tissues. So some do cross from the blood into the brain, others don't. Some target the liver, some target the heart. So it depends on what disease you're trying to treat as to what virus is selected. But also um, some viruses will fit bigger genes in than others. Um, so that's part of the selection method and how it's developed. Um, so I think um, it's really, that's sort of, I think, the theory behind gene therapy, which I hope that you found interesting in terms of understanding what it's trying to achieve and how it works. But a lot of, the, I think in theory, it's a really good idea and it sounds like, um, this could be applied across a number of diseases and certainly um, a lot of people are saying that gene therapy is running before it's walking at the moment because there's been proof that it can work in several diseases now it, um, and the technology could be applied across a number of diseases so things could change very quickly. Um, but really the pathway to getting gene therapy and being a treatment, there's a number of steps and a number of things to really stop and think about. And so before a drug is approved as a treatment that a company can sell to everybody, it needs to be proven to be safe and that it works. And um, it's initially done in labs and animals, and then it goes into clinical trials in humans. So clinical trials are looking at experimental therapies and the goals of them are to look at safety and efficacy. And it really depends on how far along they are as to what they're primarily focusing on. But because they're still investigational, it doesn't mean that it's definitely going to work or that it's definitely safe. But for people living with neuromuscular diseases, participating in a clinical trial can offer an opportunity to receive an investigational treatment at no cost before it's available, if it is proven to be safe and successful. And I guess the other things that clinical trials do is it can potentially benefit people who participate in it hopefully not cause harm, but also benefit science and the community and others that have the disease by gaining further knowledge about those treatments. But because they're investigational, safety has to be the most important thing. And I think the company really wants to show that they are working. So they will have a protocol which describes how that the study is conducted. And part of the protocol is that it's designed to show safety and efficacy. So there will be criteria on who can participate and they're really going to be to make the conduct of the trial the safest possible, but also to ensure that they're getting the answer they want so that other people can benefit in the future. But I think if you're ever thinking about a clinical trial, it's important to understand, am I eligible? Because not everybody necessarily will be until it's commercial and even then, as we know. Um, but it is investigational, so there are risks and there are benefits and you need to think closely about those. Um, and some of the eligibility criteria can be age, treatment history and gender. Um, I just wanted to spend some time talking about specific eligibility for gene therapy. Because it's a virus, um, if you've previously been exposed to that virus, you will have antibodies to it. And for some of the vectors, particularly adeno-associated virus, um, it depends on the age, but the population, um, it, the immunity to it can be 30 to 60%. 
And um, certainly if you are immune to it and the level is above a certain threshold, it would mean that if you did get the gene therapy, it probably wouldn't work because what would happen is as soon as it was introduced into your body, your immune system would attack the virus. And so to speak, the mail would never be delivered to the right address. It would be destroyed before it got there. And that, that actually could be very dangerous as well because when we're talking about the dose, if you want to get a gene into every cell of the body, you have to think about how many cells there are in a person. And there's billions of trillions of cells. So the dose that you're looking at is around 10 to the power of 14, which apparently per kilo, which is a billion trillion or there, thereabouts if it's given intravenously. So you definitely, um, I think safety is really important and I hope that um, me speaking today helps you understand that um, immunity to a virus, particularly the vector that's being proposed, would mean that it wouldn't work and it wouldn't be safe. And so not everybody is going to be eligible depending on that. I think um, science is looking at the future to try and look at ways to overcome that, to get to modify viruses so that um, the immune system won't recognise them. And I think that will actually widen up the window of people that can be eligible for it. Another point I think that's important is that it can only ever be a single dose at this point in time. And that's because if you suddenly are given a billion trillion viruses, and it, it does deliver the gene through the mail to the right cells. Um, we don't know if it's going to work sometimes and we don't know how durable it is and if it's going to wear off over time, but you'll be immune to it because you've been exposed to it. So you can't get another dose. So I think it's very important when thinking about some of the clinical trials on the horizon to really think, well, I'm only going to get one shot at this. So, I've got to ask some really important questions about this clinical trial. Um, is it going to work? Because if this is not going to work um, and they don't have the dose right and they're guessing the dose, if there's a better clinical trial that comes along in the future, I'm out because I've already been exposed to it. So um, I think it really does involve um, carefully talking to your doctors to really get an understanding about what the clinical trial is trying to achieve and how well designed it is to really make the best decision for yourself about what is going to happen. And um, because it, I think the um, another limitation is that all cells in the body potentially will be exposed to the virus and to the new gene. So there can be side effects beyond what the target is. Now the target is treating the neuromuscular disease. Um, so if it's, and if it's given intravenously, um, the first place that the virus will go is the liver. And um, one of the most notable side effects to date has been um, hepatitis or inflammation of the liver. So I mean, the best known causes of liver inflammation are hepatitis A, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And so um, a lot of the, um, um, if you read the packet warning for the gene therapy, Zolgensmer, it does say it can cause liver toxicity. And um, this has been observed in some people that have been dosed with it. And certainly, um, I think the more, the higher the dose, and if it's based on your weight, I think the more virus that your liver will be exposed to. Um, the way that this is being managed for safety in clinical trials is that steroids are being given. So they start before the injection and they're continued um, until the liver inflammation settles down. Now, my experience with the SMA clinical trial was that um, we did lots of blood tests because of safety, because we wanted to um, make sure that our patients were not getting any bad side effects. And so they were coming into the hospital once or twice a week for four to 12 weeks. And we were monitoring that and really changing doses of steroids to keep their livers safe. And a lot of people do get changes in their liver enzymes, um, but 
they were able to be modified and kept safe with steroid doses and changing them. But I mean, it's really important to think this is not a one and done where you come in, you get an injection and then you're out of hospital. There's a real commitment to safety and looking at all the side effects that the virus can do to your body over the next few months whilst um, the body's getting rid of it and sitting in the liver and it's blood tests in hospital and steroids to manage that. Um, the associated side effects of steroids with um, immunosuppression, risk of infection, um, and there are other side effects of the gene therapy as well. So it can has a risk of bleeding, and um, if you've been following the literature, um, there can be a risk of kidney reactions, kidney failure, and also um, one of the recent clinical trials in X-linked myotubular myopathy. They started at a um, a dose that was medium range and then the patients were doing well and it was all looking good and then they decided to go higher and give a really high dose to a person and those next three people died and it was unexpected it was sudden and I don't I haven't seen that they really understand why I think it was that they were the heavier older people but also that they had pre-existing liver function abnormalities so I think there's some really um, that trial's now been stopped because of such serious devastating consequences but I think really making sure that your body's healthy and it's safe to give is a really important thing and the final off target, and I don't want to just talk you out of it. I'm really sorry. There's some amazing stark benefits from it, but I think I see my job today is to give you information to make the right decisions. And part of that is the safety and what's not often talked about with gene therapy. Um, one of the final off target effects is that um, whilst a non-integrating virus that doesn't sit in your own DNA, um, that's the theory behind it. There is a small, very small risk it could integrate into your own DNA and it's not predicted where that could be. So there is a very small theoretical risk of cancer. Now this was seen in the early 2000s when they were treating immunodeficiency. Now they were using integrating vir viruses because it's a blood disorder and um, it was great the kids really were treated and they didn't have any immunodeficiency but then over time they got leukemia and it was because the virus had integrated and turned on a cancer gene right next door so we just have to be careful there is a lot we don't know about gene therapy in terms of the long term and what the side effects can be and i think because the field's advancing so quickly there's lots to learn but one of the bottlenecks, um, and it is an exciting time for the field, and I think it does offer hope, um, one of the bottlenecks is manufacturing. Because if each person's going to need a billion trillion viruses, um, it's going to be a challenge to manufacture that many different types of gene therapy to get it to patients. And so one of the big... Um, bottlenecks at the moment is manufacturing and there's lots of efforts to try and overcome that but I think you know it's a bottleneck just not only for approved therapies but also getting enough virus for research to advance new therapies to patients as well um, so that was all that I had prepared so um, thank you again and um, I'll stop now and take any questions Oh, Michelle, thank you so much. Can you can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, when you when you said millions and trillions of cells and then millions and trillions of viruses, it's just it's just incredible. The 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 work that you guys do as scientists, I'm so glad there are brains like you guys in in the world because <laughs> my brain doesn't go that far. So I want to thank you generally um, for all the work you're you're doing and you know just acknowledge that 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 you're working so hard for us as, as consumers and we really, really appreciate that. And I picked up on that idea that you said that you really do need to think carefully about, about clinical trials. You know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily um, going to, to, to be the answer. So yeah, I think that's really good that you raised that, those things. We do have a few questions, so I will, um, we'll, we'll go to those if that's all right. There's a question from Sharon um, and I'll just, for ease of time, I'll, I'll ask those questions. Um, Sharon's asked, how can we find out if we meet the criteria for gene therapy? Will it help people with 
ocular pharyngeal muscular dystrophy or um, people with Shari, um, Charcot Marie Tooth, um, that condition. So she's asked those. We've got uh, at least two more questions. Yeah, so there is um, there is something particular about oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy where I think they will need to do two, and this is really blowing my mind, I think they will have to give two gene therapies at once, one to block and one to replace. Um, so there is, um, I think people are thinking about it and the more and more you think, um, people are becoming more creative in um, looking at specific um, diseases and how to tackle them. So um, there is an approach in oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. I think it's still preclinical and um, I think it's still in the lab and in basic science. But um, I have come across some papers where people are already looking at how to do it. Um, Charcot Marie Tooth, um, there's... So many different types of Charcot Marie tooth. The answer is yes. Um, there is, I uh, think there's a um, gene replacement therapy for giant axonal neuropathy, which is in clinical trials already in the United States. And there's um, a antisense oligonucleotide, so a cousin to Nusi Nurse and a teleparson um, for Charcot Marie tooth as well. Um, so the advantage of those types of therapies are that you, you can have more than one dose, obviously, because they're not given inside the envelope of the virus. Um, so lots of different things. And I think um, I, because there's proof of concept, I actually think that there might be some investigator initiated studies. So I know that on the Westmead precinct, there's been a huge investment from the New South Wales government to make these vectors, to manufacture them, so that scientists can actually start doing more research into specific diseases. And we might, I mean, this is science fiction still, but who knows, we might be able to diagnose a patient, it's a very, very rare disease and we could ring the scientists and go, can you make something for us? I'm not saying that's the reality today, but um, I think who knows? And Michelle, there's two more questions, but they're very similar. So I'll group them. They're from Leah and Lama. Thank you guys for those questions. It's, it's really looking at, is it for the patient to take this idea to the neurologist and discuss it or will the neurologist bring it up if that's something that's on the card? Um, I think it's probably, I mean, I think both will happen and I don't think it's one or the other. I think, um, there's a website, um, from the National Institute of Health and Neurological Disorders in the United States and it's called clinicaltrials.gov and, um, that's a wonderful resource to, um, search, to look at what, clinical trials are available for your specific disease and then I think the challenge is there's so many different clinical trials how are you going to access them and not every unfortunately not every company will come to Australia um, and so I do know of instances with very rare diseases where families have gone overseas but again before you even entertain that I really strongly urge you to talk to your doctors before about that and hopefully they'll be able to help you um, share that decision. Yeah, and, and finally the registries that, that there are at the Australian Neuromuscular Registry. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I think the, pro the challenge for us doctors is we don't know every single clinical trial that's ever happening anywhere in the world. So that's why if you're following your disease, that's great. Um, because then you can take trials that you're interested in and discuss them with your doctors and we'd be very happy to look at them and talk about them. Great. Great. Well, we might, we might leave it there, Michelle, but thank you for putting such... Um, oh, we've got one last quick question. I might squeeze that in because we've got a couple minutes. Um, is game therapy research also involving pro cam research at Westmead to personalise treatment? Oh, gene therapy research also involving, is it protein research? That's from Rob. Rob? Um, I have... Okay, been... Procan, Procan, it is Procan? Yeah, pro I think Procan is, a, is understanding disease mechanisms rather than treatment strategies. Um, but if you understand disease mechanisms, um, you can 
that can lead to treatment strategies. Now, PROCAMP stands for proteomics, so understanding protein behaviour in cancer. Okay? So we need to change PROCAN to PROMIND to understand neurology. Okay? Um, and I think what's happening at Westmead with PROCAN is not in the field of neuromuscular diseases currently. Um, I think the next treatment horizon beyond all of this is RNA therapeutics, which is between the gene and the protein. But I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Is there any last questions for Professor Farah before she um, stops her presentation? Anybody? I'll, I'll put you back on gallery. Anybody waving? No one's waving. Guys, would you join me in thanking Professor Farah for her down-to-earth uh, presentation, which makes this very high-tech science stuff actually understandable for the layman. So thank you very, very much, Michelle. Um, and hopefully you'll be sticking around for a little while, would you, or are you off to a baby shower? <laughs> There's a few claps happening. I love that function. That's wonderful. Yeah. Michelle, are you there? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm sticking around. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a session on SMA. You might be, you might be wanting to go into that one in a little while, perhaps. Great. Oh, it's so weird not having a clap noise, isn't it? Thank you. We need a little background noise. It's clap, clap, clap. Thank you, Michelle. That's wonderful. We really appreciate your time today. Let's introduce our next speaker. Let me find my information. Um, we would like to introduce Samantha Bryan. Samantha is a PhD student in Sandra Cooper's lab, Professor Sandra Cooper, part of the Kids Neuroscience Centre, again at Westmead Children's Hospital. Her research is focusing on finding the genetic cause of diseases for people with undiagnosed or unfamiliar um, neuromuscular conditions, so those more rarer types. Um, she's actually our Muscular Dystrophy New South Wales PhD scholar, so this is uh, not the first time you will have met Samantha, if you've come along to this event before. But Samantha let me know that she enjoys keeping marine fish and coral in her aquariums <laughs> at home, which I think is fascinating. So would you all warmly welcome um, Samantha Bryan. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Can you see that first slide or is that not correctly shared? Hmm. Hang on one second. Ah, yes. Yep. How's that? Can everyone see that? Coming up now, yeah. Great. Yeah, so as, um, as uh, I was introduced, yes, I'm a PhD student, um, and I'm, today I'm just going to give a, a quick uh, talk about uh, what, what I do on a day to day basis. Um, yep, so I'm at the um, Kids Neuroscience Centre, which is part of the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, and my research really focuses on trying to find the answer, the genetic answer of disease for, for those who have undiagnosed neuromuscular disorders. Um, so it's very important to find a genetic diagnosis if we can, because it can guide clinical management. It can also allow for family planning and prenatal genetic diagnosis. And as Michelle was talking about before, with, with certain treatments like on the horizon, um, gene therapy and stuff, uh, we aren't really use those therapies unless we know exactly what the problem is on, at a genetic level to then be able to um, address it. Um, so the current diagnostic pathway for neuromuscular disorders looks something like this. So you'll, you'll first see a, a clinician um, who specializes in, in muscle disorders and they'll do a clinical examination, get some tests done, and they'll try to figure out uh, what umbrella of neuromuscular disease um, your symptoms will fit under. Um, some of the more common but still quite rare disorders um, can be diagnosed uh, relatively quickly with certain um, known tests, so stuff like um, spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, we can do uh, tests or diagnostic labs will do um, tests for those initially and um, hopefully find something. But if, we, if they can't find anything at that point, um, a, a blood sample can be sent to um, Perth for the neuromuscular gene panel. So this is just a um, sequencing of all genes that we currently know are associated with neuromuscular disorders. Um, and they'll sift through those to see if they can find anything. Um, if this is negative and we can't find anything, this, uh, we can progress to whole exome sequencing. Um, so this is starting to become more common in a diagnostic setting. 
uh, but we still do a lot of this um, at a research basis. Um, yep, and after, and after that we can progress to whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing. And this is where our lab come in because this isn't a routine diagnostic um, test just yet. This is more us seeing how, how well we can use these tools to find a diagnosis in a research setting. So for those who um, do progress to these uh, uh, sequencing options to try and find the answer, we find a diagnosis for less than 50% of families. Um, so yeah, that's what all my, my project and our research is all about, trying to, to help those other 50%. So the reason it's so difficult to uh, find an answer is that uh, our genetic makeup, our, our genome is made up of 3 billion DNA base pairs. So like 3 billion letters of code that we need to sift through to try and find the answer. So it's very much like trying to find a needle in a haystack um, at, at this point. So um, the average person has 4 million non-coding variants. So variants is just a change, something that's different from you to the next person. So. Um, about 4 million non-coding variants and 20,000 coding variants, which in theory, any one of those could be the genetic cause for a new muscular disorder. Um, but we can apply filters to all this data because we can't just go through every single one manually. It would just take hours and hours. So we can look at the 600 or so neuromuscular disease genes that we are aware of, and we can look through those first. We can also, in those genes, uh, carefully select genes that we think match the phenotype of the patient um, better than others. So, you know, certain subcategories of neuromuscular conditions have different symptoms and we can sort of use that information to try and hone down uh, where we should be looking for, for the answer. Um, in addition to that, we can uh, look at how each, each of these changes, these, these variants um, uh, are inherited throughout the family. So if there are multiple affected individuals in a family and they all have the one variant and um, unaffected family members don't have it, then it's more likely to be the disease. But if you're looking at one and you find that a healthy person also has it, then unlikely to be the, the answer. We can also look at what's, um, what the general population have in terms of variants. So if, if uh, you have a variant that nobody else in the population has, it's only your family that have this variant, then it's more likely to be uh, the cause than if um, every second person on the street had it, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, we're looking for really rare things. So, yeah, so after we apply all these filters, sometimes we can be left with zero variants or sometimes a thousand. It really depends. And um, sometimes for every filter that applied, I can think of an example where um, the answer lied outside that filter, like it wasn't a known neuromuscular disease gene at this point, or it was weirdly uh, common in the population, or it didn't fit the phenotype, or um, it didn't, uh, the inheritance pattern in the family looked very strange and was puzzling us for years. So uh, there's a lot of playing around with these filters and trying to figure out, like, you know, how can we look outside the box? Where can we look to find an answer? So I spend a lot, a lot of my time just at my computer looking at looking at all this data, sifting through it, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but if I do find something um, that I think is interesting and I would like to follow it up, the question we need to ask ourselves is, can we provide experimental evidence that whatever I've found um, is the cause of disease? So this is where um, patient samples can become really valuable for us um, in some cases. So it, here on the left is our uh, vapor phase tank at the Kids Neuroscience Center. And this is a rack that contains lots of different um, patient samples that we can, we can use to ask specific questions about these, these changes, these genetic changes that are found. So yeah, muscle biopsies are, are very common in neuromuscular diseases. They're, become, they're becoming less common as, um, we, as we're improving our diagnostic techniques um, and, and getting better at filtering the genetic data. We, we, can, we can sometimes move away from biopsies in, in some cases. So here's a picture of a very thin slice of muscle under a microscope, um, and all, all the little circles are individual muscle fibers. Um, blood samples can also be very useful. Uh, skin cells are, are a great source of um, ongoing genetic information because we can grow these up um, continuously in the lab and um, harvest them as we need to, to, to have you know, an ongoing source of, um, of DNA and RNA. And we've started trying this with um, cells grown from urine samples, which um, is a much easier source a sample to obtain from a patient, far less invasive than a muscle biopsy. But as you can imagine, urine cells aren't really much like um, 
muscle cells. So because there's that big difference, sometimes this isn't always um, helpful for the research question we have in mind. Um, so a typical day might be me putting my head in the, the literal nitrogen tank, not literally, but peering down, trying to find the rack and the sample that I need. I'll put it on dry ice and take it um, over to this machine here, which is called a cryostat. Um, so the chamber where my hands are in um, contains this uh, mounting block, so you can affix the muscle to this uh, circle there, and it slices eight microns of muscles, which is like less than a, a hundredth of a millimeter, if you can imagine just how thin that is. Um, but this means by being able to cut it up so thinly means we can use a very small amount of patient sample because uh, these samples are very precious and um, no one wants to have to do that process twice. Uh, yep. Um, so one, one of the questions we can ask with these samples is, um, have the genetic instructions been made correctly in the cell? So if I found something at my computer, um, what I can do is I can design an experiment just to look at that one little section of, D, of DNA in, in a patient sample, and I can make lots and lots of copies of it, like even more copies than that. And then I can load all of these copies that I've made um, into a gel, and then I can run electricity through this gel and what that does is it migrates my DNA out um, as per size. Um, so in this particular example here, I've designed my experiment to, to amplify DNA um, to, a, to a size of 268 base pairs. And so here is my ladder of sizes that I can compare my, my control samples to. So it's under 300, so yeah, that's about 268. Um, and then when we look at uh, the patients here, We've got some extra bands um, that, are, that are bigger than 268 and smaller than 268. So that implies or shows us, and we can sequence these, shows us that there is information missing or there's um, information we shouldn't have that's been included. And this gives us like really good functional evidence that these variants are having negative changes and this states that this is actually the cause of this person's neuromuscular disorder. Um, this, this sample here is the, the mother who is a carrier and we can see that they have mostly a normal bright band at the normal size and but still a little bit of uh, missing information. So um, explaining why their, their, their phenotype is less severe. So this showed a really good fit for the family. Um, in this particular example, we also had skin cells and we were able to show the same sort of pattern of, of misinformation um, in, in the skin cells. And the advantage of using skin cells in this example is we can put um, certain chemicals on to test for certain things. And then later, if there are um, treatments we want to trial, um, we can use these cells to see what we can do with these cells that might then lead to, to treatments in the future. Another question we can ask with these samples is, is there enough protein being made? Uh, so this is in the example of uh, dystrophin, which is an, is, the, is an important protein in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and Becker's muscular dystrophy. So the brightness of this band corresponds to how much dystrophin is being made. So in C1 and C2 are controls, and X is just, I've loaded it X and out of times. So half of X here and then quarter X for, for, for these lanes, if that makes sense. So the, these are a quarter the strength of these bands here. So when we load the patient up next to these um, controls, we see that it's a much fainter band compared to this full loaded control. And we can even see here that it's less than a quarter. So now we can tell um, the clinician that the patient has less than a quarter of dystrophin being made, which would um, put them clinically as, as Becker's muscular dystrophy, which um, is important later for, for clinical trial eligibility and um, treat, treatment options. Um, another way we can look at if, if there's enough protein being made is by immunohistochemistry. So going back to when I made those very thin slices in the cryostat, um, we can then basically match a fluorescent molecule that will only bind to the protein we're interested in, so in this case, dystrophin, and um, it binds and brightly stains wherever there is dystrophin, um, and that's what, that's what this, this white is. And here in, the, in our patient's uh, sample, uh, it's very dimly white in places. In here, it's, it's mostly black, so we can see that there's a big deficiency in uh, where dystrophin is. And these methods can also be very useful if we haven't found the genetic diet, like a, a, an actual variant yet, 
but we see that this particular protein is not being made, then we know to look in the gene DMD, which makes dystrophin. And that gives us a really strong reason to look in a, in a certain area. Um, so yeah, my research thus far for, I'm in my third year of my PhD. Um, it's contributed to finding the genetic diagnosis for over 30 families, um, which I'm, I really feel honored to be able to have helped. And um, it's been really a rewarding experience. I've also managed to publish uh, three first author papers and I'm co-author on three and we have uh, plans to, to submit some more. And I couldn't have done this without my scholarship from Muscular Dystrophy New South Wales. So thank you very much for, for your support and taking this financial burden from me. Um, and I would like to thank the families for their invaluable contribution to this research. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Samantha, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And it was so good the way that you put your presentation together with pictures of what you actually do in a lab, because I'm not very familiar with what goes on in a lab. So that was really useful. And to hear that you've helped diagnose 30 people with a condition, that's, that's really important because information is power for, 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 for us. So thank you very, very much. Um, we've got a question from Nina. I might just unmute you, Nina, and see if you could... Um, actually just ask that question. Nina, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That was really interesting. Um, do you do any genetic work for adults? Um, yes, we do quite a bit of uh, genetic work for adults. It's sort of, we have um, clinicians from very, very many different hospitals and um, all around the world, in fact, who, um, if they have a particular patient and they uh, have gone negative for all the tests, then they can ask for our opinion. And, and hopefully, if we have the money at the time, we're able to take on more patients and, and get some more testing done. Right. Okay. So, would I be able to contact you or should I ask my specialist? Um, yeah, I think... It might be best to ask your specialist first and maybe talk about uh, Sandra Cooper, specifically mention Sandra Cooper's lab and maybe she'd be able to, to email. So um, uh, maybe I can grab your details after the, this talk. That would be yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, enough, yeah, no worries. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ina. Thank you for answering that, Samantha. That's great. Is there any other questions that um, we have before our break time? Anybody? waving around. No. Michelle, I just wondered, are you there with us still, Michelle? Yeah, I'm here. Would you possibly put the link to the website you sort of suggested was a really good place to find information? Would you mind yep. sharing that in our chat box at all? Will do. That'd be great. I was about to Google it and I couldn't remember what it was called. <laughs> so thank you very much. Samantha, thank you for your time today and Thank you so much for your work in our scholarship program. That's wonderful that we've been able to help you do such wonderful work. So, awesome. Um, have you got longer in that period? Yes, clap, clap for Samantha. That's a very good idea. <laughs> have you got time? Um, is that program continuing or? Um... Um, yeah, yes it is. Or as, as we get, so currently, most of our funding for, for the actual sequencing itself came from the Broad Institute in Boston. And they're in the process of putting it through another grant at the moment to try and get more funding to continue the program onwards. So it will depend on uh, what they're like, but we will still, like, on an ad hoc basis, I suppose, um, send some patients here and there. But we, um, we, we are a bit tight for money at the time, so we have to be selective, um, unfortunately. And it's really heartbreaking but, uh, to, to not be able to take on every single case. But, um, yeah. We, yeah, we do what we can. Yeah, and one final question, Samantha. Is there other labs that do similar work that you do for adults happening? I imagine they're all over the place, are they? Yeah, they, yeah, they are all over the place. Like I think um, I'm not I'm not quite sure about specific details, but I know um, there are some things going on in Melbourne and in Perth and um, in other places around Australia. Um, so yeah, I think I think I'm not quite sure because I'm because I'm not a doctor and I um, I sort of just do all the all the lab work. Um, I'm not sure how it works to actually get in touch with with us. I guess from that perspective, because I, I, I speak to a lot of clinicians who um, who who uh, speak to the patients. So um, whether it's just that the our network of people and, get, and getting into that network or how that works, but um, if if anybody's interested, I can try and point you in the correct direction and see see what we can do. Yeah, and I think our advice would always be to go back to your 
treating physician, your neurologist or your specialist. So that would be yeah. our, our general advice to people when they are interested in, in getting involved in diagnosis or if they have an ongoing undiagnosed condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. You so much, Brock, Samantha. That's really, really great. Um, we're going to move to a, a break. I've seen Michelle's added the link. Thank you very much, Michelle. We're going to break now for till three o'clock, but at five to three, if you could, could kindly go, come back and go in, that way you can go straight into your breakout rooms. So if we can get people having a 10 minute quick break, grab something to eat or grab a drink and um, we'll be back in 10 to 15 minutes, 3 p.m. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. <laughs>